Amen. Well, it really is a joy to be with you. Uh, love your church, love what God's doing. It's my first time out here, uh, but I've hung out with your pastor a lot. I met him uh, in 2015 at uh, just a fun little event. Eugene Peterson invited a group of pastors to his cabin in Montana. The last group of pastors he met with uh, before he sort of fully retired. And I don't know how I got to be on that trip, but I was on that trip. And uh, your pastor was on that trip, and that's where I met him. I just remember thinking, who is this spunky little Californian uh, <laughs> on this trip? So much energy, uh, so much vision. And over the years, last seven or eight years, we've built a great friendship. We've spent a week together every year, confessing our sin, opening up our hearts, praying for our kids, talking through our marriages. So we've been on a journey for a long time. And uh, I, I want you to know, he speaks so highly of you. It's great to have pastors who love to preach. Well, you know what's better? When you have a pastor who loves his church and your pastor loves you, the way he speaks about you with such care and compassion, such vision and such pride at what God's doing in your midst. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to be around him. And so it's, it's a joy to be able to preach to you today. Now, I've got to give you a fair warning. Um, I got a heavy talk for you today, okay? He did something dangerous. You know what he did? He said, preach whatever's on your heart. <laughs> so here we go. Let's jump in. Uh, I want to start with a question, and it's a sincere question, not a humorous one. When is the last time that you wept? Not just got caught up, choked up, was a phrase we use, man, I got choked up. One or two moments where you sort of, were unable to speak, but really from your spirit, you wept. And what was that about? What was that about? What does it reveal about your heart or your life or the things that you have been through? Part of the problem that we have in our lives today is we get so used to the brokenness around us, we can forget to weep. Psychologists talk about uh, a phenomenon called habituation. And here's what the American Psychological Association says it is. Habituation is a decrease in response to a stimulus after repeated presentations. Habituation involves growing accustomed to a situation or stimulus, thereby diminishing its effectiveness. You see this in your home, don't you? Maybe when you move into a new apartment or you buy something, you're like, wow, that wall is yellow. It's horrible. Uh, we need to paint that. And then five years later, you're like, the wall's yellow? I mean, I never even noticed that. You just get used to whatever's in front of you. Our ability, and when you're growing up, this is an important part of your natural development, which means you're not consciously thinking about navigating everything. You just, it's in the background. But when this happens to the brokenness in our world, this is not good. So many people need a heartfelt response from followers of Jesus, but they don't find it. It's because we're just, we've habituated ourselves to the brokenness of the world. Here's just a little list, just like a two minute brainstorm of what it is that people go through. Personal illness. If you've ever been sick, had a sick family member, this will dominate your life. Broken relationships, traumatic events, natural disasters, Wealth inequality, racial injustice, personal sin, secularism and religious decline, war and conflict, environmental crises. You know, you turn on the news and there's a polar bear dying and there's a war in another country and there's riots in some other city and you're just like, anyway, where are we going for lunch? I mean, you just get so used to it, everything that's happening in the world. Best case, we get numb. Worst case, we get cynical that anything can change. When a Christian's heart gets cynical, it's like a, a, a broken immune system in the body of Christ. And we've got to learn to get our hearts back. So I want to talk to you today about weeping our way back to the heart of God. Tears are an interesting human phenomenon, aren't they? Why does water come out of our eyes? It's a weird phenomenon. It happens at inappropriate times sometimes. Ben Holden says this, tears also unite us as humans because we're the only species that cries. The only species that cries, even Charles Darwin himself, was at a loss to explain the uniquely human trait described as that special expression of man. 
You've never been to the zoo and seen a monkey in the corner just sort of like shaking and weeping. You'd be like, what's wrong? It's like someone took his banana and his girlfriend and he's, uh, he's in the corner, he's just weeping it out. We share 98% of the same genetic material as chimpanzees. What is this thing that we do as humans that is to weep? They tell us there's three kinds of tears. Functional tears, this is just when the glands in our eyes produce a sort of liquid so that our eyes don't get dry. This happens through blinking. You've got utility tears when you're cutting onions. It's your body's response. Uh, kid pokes you in the eye, your eyes water. It's a response. It's a defense mechanism. But there's a third kind of tears. And it's the tears that theologians call sacred tears. And these are the kinds of tears when uh, the vagan nerve that goes all, all the way from basically all the way down into the, the gut flora inside our stomachs, which is, which is where we get our sense of connection and empathy with people. There's such a deep connection with other people that our whole being feels like we have to respond and the physical response is tears. It is a divine sense of connection and belongings. And this is why when people talk about the person of Jesus, it's really quite extraordinary. A lot of Jesus is unique amongst all the religious options in the world. Many of the teachers of great religious traditions, their goal in essence is, is like it's stoicism or stoicism plus. It's a withdrawing, a resignation to what happens in your life. It's controlling what you can and not worrying about the rest. And a lot of times people think that this is all Jesus is, a good teacher with some morals or a kind man who was murdered by an unjust regime, crushed in the tectonic plates of power. But that's not what we see with Jesus. Jesus seems to have the nerve systems of God Almighty connected to the brokenness of the human condition. Jesus was a man moved to tears. If you were to have coffee with Jesus just at Phil's, okay, and you were to get together with Jesus and you were to say to him, Jesus, how do you feel about Southern California? What do you think he'd say? By the way, you guys disciples of Jesus, like you're consciously trying to become like Jesus, learn from him, take on his character and his heart. Um, and if you were to say, Jesus, what do you think he'd be like? Oh, I love it here. The beaches are great. Reminds me of Galilee, honestly, a lot of similarities. I don't think that's what he'd say. I think Jesus would say, my heart is broken for the sin, rebellion, dysfunction and pain of Southern California. John 11 is a, a fascinating chapter. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her, also weeping. This is about the death of Lazarus. It says he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. This is the same idea of a horse before it gallops. This is the horse that literally is like, it's, like it's, it's got steam out of his nostrils, pouring. It's a strong, aggressive word. Jesus' response to encountering the death of his friends it's not stoic resignation, but it is divine trouble and anger when he encounters the brokenness of the human condition. He'll go on in a few verses to two of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture. In essence, it's the whole gospel. Jesus webbed. Here is Jesus intimately connected with what's happening in the world. As Jesus approaches Jerusalem in Luke 19, He's, he's, he's angry that they failed to recognize the Messiah, but it's not, its not his primary response. What is it? It says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Here is Jesus intimately connected, empathetically drawn, related, caught up in, responding physically to the situation of his city. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us that if you could get Go and be in a prayer meeting with Jesus. You ever wanted to be in a prayer meeting with Jesus? It's all kinds of prayer meetings, Baptist ones, Pentecostal ones, Presbyterian ones, Lutheran ones. You get these prayer meetings. And uh, what would Jesus be like in a prayer meeting? Well, here's what we read behind the scenes, that he lifted up loud cries with tears. Nicholas Waldersdorf says this, the tears of God are the meaning of history. Now, that's an interesting phrase. What does he mean by that? All human societies are trying to figure out how to narrate the story of history. Is it fundamentally an economic story, the rise and fall of economic systems? Is it a national story or the rise and fall of empires or countries? Is it a story of technology? 
the movement and acceleration of civilizations because of the technology they build. Here's what he is saying. History can be told and made meaningful and understood through the tears of God. What is it that makes Jesus weep? That lets you know what matters in the world. St. Ephraim says this from the third century, until you've cried, you don't know God. You might be a philosopher, you might be a theologian, but until you feel that burden of brokenness, you're not in a relationship with God Almighty. Bishop J.C. Ryle will go on and say, the greater are our affections, the deeper are our afflictions. And the more we love, the more we have to weep. The more we love, I can tell you this, the more we have to weep for. So what do we do with this phenomenon called tears? First thing I want you to see today, you got to learn to bring your tears to God. Bring your tears to God. God is aware of our tears. Psalm 39 verse 12 says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent to my tears. You ever been in that place? Rebellious kid, struggling relationship, tension or failure at work. Just feel like you can't get through life and all you can do, you can't even pray in the presence of God. You get in your room and all you can do is just weep. And here is the psalmist saying, Lord, please, all I got is my tears. See them. Psalm 56 says this, you've taken account of my wanderings. You've put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? If you could open the divine book narrating the human story, it would be a book stained with tears. But then it says that God puts our tears in a bottle. I got a little tear bottle. Do we have slides or? Yeah. No. Nah. No slides? On the slides. Sweet. Uh, here's, a, here's the tear bottle. This is, a, this is a, a tear bottle from the ancient Near East. And what would happen? Women, when, the, when men would go off to war, the wives, as they would miss their husbands and weep, would weep them into a bottle and then send them to their husbands on the battlefield. You want to motivate a man's heart? Here's a wife saying, homeboy, come home. <laughs> That's a man with something to fight for. That's a man with skin in the game. You know what's more extraordinary? You've got God collecting your tears to move his heart. Isn't that extraordinary? It says, my tears are in your bottle. My tears are they're staining the pages of the divine telling of human life. God sees our tears in 2 Kings 20 when Hezekiah is at a moment of incredible peril. It says, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. That's God's reply. I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. I think one of the most extraordinary accounts in the Bible, I, I, I pretty often think that the most beautiful chapter in all of human literature, is Luke 15. Luke 15 is the story of the prodigal son. And, uh, but now I'm torn. I think Luke 7 may be. Luke 7 is this the account of uh, Jesus being invited to a Pharisee's house. We always think about Jesus raging at the Pharisees. Now he's having dinner with one. And uh, you imagine being in this room. Imagine being in a really nice restaurant. And you look over and it's Jesus with a Pharisee. Can you imagine, see, we'll talk about an, a tense environment and pressure. And uh, so this is what we read in Luke's gospel, Luke 7. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Okay, so they're in relaxed mode. But then here we see something extraordinary happen. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating there. Now, what is a woman living a sinful life? This is a sex worker. Now, in a purity culture and a shame culture and a patriarchal culture, the, probably the worst thing you could be in terms of feeling stigmatized and cast out was to be a prostitute. And so she's, she's banned from participating in synagogue life because she's unclean. She can't go to the temple and worship. She's not allowed in there. Where does this woman go to find hope? What does this woman do with her tears? So something in this woman has heard a rumor about Jesus, that he's a man of mercy. And she is so desperate to put her tears in front of someone who will see her that she has the courage or the desperation to go into a dinner with a Pharisee, find Jesus, and then we read. 
She came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Now, some of you are like, well, they did weird things back in the... No, it's no, this is, there's never been a human culture of which I'm aware where this is a normalised or appropriate moment. This is a, a history-shaking, scandalous moment. And so Simon the Pharisee is, uh, is terribly upset. And he says, well, I, I thought this bloke might be a Pharisee, but he can't be. Because if he knew who this woman was, there's no way he would let her uncleanness pollute him. Then Jesus says, let me tell you a story. Listen, can I tell you this? If you sense Jesus is about to tell you a story, just repent in advance, okay? <laughs> These stories are never going to be to build you up and encourage you and inspire you. Uh, they're not going to end well. They're going to end with a rebuke. So he tells this story and it's, it's a story about a person who's uh, forgiven a little bit and then a person who's forgiven a lot. And then he says to the Pharisee, the reason you don't love is because you think you don't need mercy. And the reason she loves so much is because she's been forgiven so much. And uh, this is the most amazing thing. Jesus takes a woman with cultural shame that has no capacity to be expunged in her current religious system and creates a wedge against the accusation of religion to honor her and distribute mercy to her. And Jesus receives her tears. And I, I think that message, I don't think the world, the world understands that's what Jesus does with a shame-filled person's tears. I don't think the typical person out there in this community weeping, looking for a new start thinks, oh, I better get to Jesus. They view the church as the source of everything wrong with the world, not a gateway to the man who will receive your tears. I want to say to you today, if you came here and you got shame hiding behind good makeup or you got shame behind a, a good body, you're looking good and you feel good, but you need to bring your tears to Jesus, there is a window of mercy for you today. And you can bring it to Him and you can find healing. You can find relief from the accusation of religion against your mistakes to find restoration and mercy in the heart of Jesus. So I want to say to you, this could be your moment today. This could be your moment. Don't let it pass you by. John Eldridge says this, a wound that goes unacknowledged and unwept is a wound that cannot heal. And if you're carrying something, and this could be a day of weeping for the wounds in your spirit, come and bring your tears to Jesus. Second thing that we need to do with our tears is we need to learn to weep for people who've rejected God. Let me, let me ask you a question. Do you really believe that people are lost? Really? Do you believe that hell is an actual place or is it just some religious symbol for a psychological state of suffering? What do you believe that hell actually is? Listen, I got some bad news for you. Nobody talked about hell more than Jesus in the Bible. And it's almost like he did everything within his power to stop people going there. Jesus will even go on to say, do not fear those who can touch your body. Fear those who can throw your soul into hell. And I just, I, I think we've gotten so casual. We have, we've turned Jesus into a bubble head of divine love. And he's just walking around telling everyone they're awesome. Rather than having a sense of that was a good bubble head, by the way, I do want to acknowledge. Uh, <laughs> Jesus is walking around weeping terrified, warning people about their lostness. You wish you could have coffee with Paul? Get together with Paul at Phil's. Good time at Phil's, by the way. What do you think Paul would say? Hey, Paul, how do you feel about how uh, things are going here in uh, SoCal? Do you think he'd be like, again, did Jesus mention the beaches? I love them. You know, I don't think that would be his response. When he goes to these cities, these Greco-Roman cities, what we read again and again and again is tears for brokenness. In Philippians 3, he says this, many of whom I have often told you and now tell you again, even with tears, that they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And what does it say their end is? Destruction. It says that God's their belly, their glory's in their shame, their minds are set 
unearthly things. Paul will go on in Romans 9, further revealing his heart to say, I've grown, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. You ever met someone like that? Let me tell you, I think part of our challenge in the world today, I, I once uh, had a t- t- terrifying experience. I lost my five-year-old son in the middle of Rock Center at Christmas. I lost him. Like straight up, where's my kid? And I'm, I'm having an outer body experience like, oh, please God, no, do not tell me this is our family story. We lost our kid. And uh, for about 45 minutes, the level of terror, existential dread, God, please, no, God, please, no. And um, I'm basically, I mean, Where's it? Help, help. Where's my son? You see my son? About a week before, I had made him memorize my cell phone number. And 45 minutes later, my son, I get a phone call. Hey, are you John Tyson? Yes. I'm a security guard. I got your kid. Where? Where is he? And what had happened is we were crossing from one window, Christmas shopping to another, and he saw a train set and thought he'd just pop in Saks Fifth Avenue and get himself a little train. And he said, when I realized I was lost, I looked for someone in a uniform like you told me and told him to call you. Man, I wanted to throttle and hug this kid simultaneously. (laughs) But I'm telling you, that feeling, New York City ceased to exist. There was one reality, where is my son? And I've got to tell you, a lot of us live in the luxury and it's a luxury God does not have. And it's, our, it's of tuning out the lostness of the world. And if you were to get around Jesus, you would feel him saying, where are my kids? There would be a relentless passion that Jesus has. Psalm 119 says, my eyes shed streams of tears because they do not follow your law. I was walking home from an elders meeting last Monday night walking through Hell's Kitchen and uh, just saw so much godlessness in a one-mile strip. And the, 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 the gift of New York is that you see the consequences of sin, not just the pleasure of sin. And I'm just surrounded by people who have tried everything and none of it's working and there's despair in their eyes. And I just felt myself weeping like, God, there's not even a plausibility structure for these people to consider Jesus. How do I get Jesus to these people? Rivers of tears. Jeremiah 9 says this, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Some people call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. Corey Russell points out, Jeremiah is a prophet of a weeping God. It's God with tears, not the prophet. He's going to say in Lamentation 2, my eyes fail because of tears. My spirit's greatly troubled. My heart's poured out on the earth because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes run down with streams of water. Dry eyes are a sign of spiritual decline. So we're going to learn to bring our tears to God. We've got to learn to weep for the lost and then we need to learn to weep out of love for one another, wanting to to care about each other's stories, see them grow to reach their full redemptive potential. In Acts 20, Paul will say, for three years I didn't cease night and day to admonish everyone. How? With tears. To be in a theology and leadership meeting with Paul is to be in a meeting where tears are present. 2 Corinthians 2, he says this, I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of, anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. At the end of his life, Paul's in a prison, the Mamertine prison in Rome, and he knows he's about to die. Nero's about to launch, blame the Christians for the burning of Rome. Paul's going to get caught up in that and beheaded by Nero because he's a Roman citizen. And he says, I recall your tears to Timothy. When he thinks back on his relationship with Timothy, his love with him, serving God, the thing he's going to say is, I long to see you even as I recall your tears. 
He's moved. His reference point is not just church plants. His reference point is tears. Now, you know what the problem in a place like uh, we're in right now? I think we're in the Orange County. Okay, I think that part of the problem of a place like this, you want to know what it is? There's a lot of churches here. They call this the Bible Belt of California. And uh, I could get in a car and get to a great church. Not this great, but pretty great. In like 10 minutes in any direction. You know the problem with that? Is it produces consumers. Most people come to church today. We've been discipled by our culture to live by reviews, don't we? First thing you do is look at the reviews. Oh, what's the review? Oh, it's a two star. No, thank you. I, I, I had to stop looking at Google reviews of our church in New York. I was like, that ain't it. Is that our church? People show up with a scorecard. How were the greeters? Were they friendly? Level of friendliness. Not too friendly where they're like psychos. Like, it's like it, love bombing in a cult. And not so cold where you didn't feel like, well, at least they saw me. And so you've got a little rating, 8 out of 10 on the greeters, okay? A 9 out of 10 because there's a nice breeze that's coming through from the parking lot to the marina right here. So 9 for that. And uh, how's the music? Oh, somewhere between Bethel and Upper Room. That's my preference. Okay. That's a nine. And uh, if you're single, you're looking around, you're like, will my relational needs and future possibilities be met in the uh, available community in the room? If you're a little older, uh, perhaps you're thinking like, is there two small groups for people over 50 in this whole church? Am I stuck with the 20 other people over 50? You've got all these rating systems. Here's the problem. When you have a church scorecard and you rate churches and there's so many options for church, here's what you, you stop doing. Loving the people in the church. You build your experiences on reinforcing your preferences. And it's, you know how consumer culture works? It finds your preferences through algorithms and then sells you your preferences. And if all you do is go to a church where you love everything, all you're doing is reinforcing your weaknesses. Nobody optionally says, let me go to a church that I don't like for my own formation and development. <laughs> Churches should not be defined by the quality of their programs, but by the depth of their love. I think many times Jesus would walk through a church and say, hey, this stuff's all great, but you do not love one another. By this, by this, well, all men know that you are my disciples, that we love one another. Got to learn to care about one another. You got to learn to see the people, not the programs, the hearts, not the sermons. You got to learn to see what's going on. I promise you there is pain in this room today that requires deep love. And if we don't see it, if you leave right away, everyone just boosts out straight after. People don't even have time for lunch today. One of the things our church does is invites first-timers out to lunch. And sometimes people say, like, it's been 10 years since someone invited me to lunch. And uh, just we don't even have margin in our lives for lunch for newcomers. This is a challenge. So I want to say this to you. We've got to learn to know people well enough that we weep for what they're going through. We've got to love them to the point of tears. Now, this is quite a bit here already. Okay, we're talking about tears. We're talking about bringing our tears and shame to God. We're talking about weeping for the lost world. We're talking about getting through our preferences and loving one another to the point of tears. But I want you to know this. None of this is in vain. Tears are signs that breakthrough is coming. Tears lead to breakthrough. In uh, Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah is an amazing man. I love Nehemiah because he wasn't a pastor one a prophet or a priest. He just worked for the government. He was a government worker. And uh, he's a, a wine tester for the king. And uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the context of Nehemiah. Let me give it to you in 20 seconds. Nehemiah is uh, distant. He's in the capital of Susa in Persia. And the exiles who've been judged for their unfaithfulness to God's covenant after their time of exile have made their way back to Israel. And Jerusalem is a city, but it's a city in ruins. And the temple, when the temple gets built and they see this temple after Solomon's temple, they weep compared to what the first one was. And they can't build their wall, so they're, super, they're susceptible to people coming in and out. And everybody knows this. 
And everyone's like, oh, man, it sucks to be an exile, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. What can you do? I'm in, I'm in Susa. I'm not a priest or a prophet. And he asks a question and he says this, how are the exiles doing? And then someone says, not good, mate. Really? Yeah, the walls are broken down. The gates are burned. They're vulnerable. And that one question takes a government employee into the adventure and journey of a lifetime. God grips his heart. For, it says for a period of four months, he mourns and weeps and fasts before the God of heaven. And here's what he has a realization. I can't sit in privilege while my nation struggles. And his question draws him out of personal peace and affluence into the cause and, and, and purpose of God for his generation. And he's going to have to risk. He's going to have to pray. He ends up leaving his position, going on a journey, helping them rebuild. And he saw more fruit in 52 days than the previous 52 years. And it was all birthed in prayer. Tears change our hearts. And I can tell you this, when tears are on your cheeks, it's a sign that God will do something soon. It's like God can't ignore the tears of his people. Hannah, you know Hannah's story. Hannah goes in and she's, uh, she lives in a, a culture where women's, a lot of a woman's sense of self-esteem and value is in their ability to produce sons. And uh, she, she can't even get pregnant. She's got fertility is infertility issues. And uh, so she goes up every year and it's even worse there's another woman who's like having kids, like one, two, and, she, and she's being tormented by this accusing spirit. And she gets into the temple and she prays with such fervency that the priest hasn't seen it in a generation and thinks she's drunk. And she's like, sorry, I'm not drunk, I'm desperate. And God hears her prayer and a prophet is born. You never know what tears will do. Tears are the sign that God is getting ready to move. Psalm 126 says, it's those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. And those that go out with weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing the sheaves with them. I don't know how familiar you are with St. Augustine. You've probably heard of him before. He wasn't always St. Augustine. There was a season he was just Augustine. And we, at our church, we call him Gussie. And uh, <laughs> Gussie was a little bit of a wild man. Loved to party, super promiscuous, had a kid out of wedlock, wanted to, wanted to climb the social circles of Rome, be a philosopher, be someone who spoke well. And, uh, but Augustine had a mother named Monica who was a godly woman. And uh, Monica was just heartbroken about what Gussie would do. And she'd pray for him, Lord, draw him to yourself. And then he'd join a cult. Draw him to yourself, Lord. Make him godly. Gets this woman pregnant. And uh, he's famous for saying this, Lord, give me chastity. Just not yet. You know, like in the later season in my life, okay. And uh, so what, it's like her prayers just failed again and again and again. So she goes to visit her local bishop, who happens to be Ambrose. And she goes to see him and she's just wearing him out. What are we going to do about Augustine? What are we going to do about him? He's lost. He's getting worse. I'm praying nothing's happening. And finally, out of exasperation, the bishop says to her this quote, It is not possible that a child of such tears could be lost. And for some reason in her heart, she was like, I think you're right. And it was within a very short period of time that the bishop made that declaration that Augustine has shown a copy of the life of St. Anthony and it shakes him about the power of devotion. And then he hears the voice, take up and read, take up and read. And he reads and it says, come into the light out of your darkness and your sexual immorality. And he's like, he wakes up. And for the rest of his life, here's what Augustine called himself, a child of tears. I am so grateful for the prayers of my father. I am a child of tears. When I was a teenager, uh, I, wasn't a, I was a complete and utter hellion, but not on purpose. Like I was a, a super rebellious kid, but with a good attitude. And I, rem I remember my mom screaming out at me, why are you trying to break my heart? I was like, I'm not trying to break anything. I'm trying to go to the beach and party. Uh, I don't know what your heart has to do with my pleasure. And uh, I just I was a child of tears and uh, I was causing tears. And uh, one day, um, 
I did have a couple of what I would just describe as light skirmishes with the people employed by the government to reinforce the laws. <laughs> and uh, they came knocking on our house. Is John Tyson here? He is not here. Do you know where he is? We're not comfortable disclosing that level of parental information to you. I had no idea where I was. But something snapped in my dad's spirit. And he'd tried everything. He, he grounded me for a whole summer and made me dig ditches. And I love a challenge like that. I'm like, look, man, I'm going to have some protein and get ripped and dig ditches and lose weight in the sun. What else you got? <laughs> I'm about to transform myself over the summer and be better when I come back to school. What else you got? <laughs> he realized that forcing me was powerless. So he said, I've got to go get his heart in prayer. My dad began to pray and fast. My dad got all Pentecostal, man. He got a little vial of oil. He'd go into my bedroom and put a cross on my pillow and say, in the name of Jesus, haunt his dreams, Holy Spirit. <laughs> go to the window I was sneaking out of, because they always know. And he'd say, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, hound him as he goes and bring guilt when he comes in. Went to my closet and said, in the name of Jesus, I prophesy over this kid's life. With little oil crosses everywhere. What's all this oil in my room? <laughs> little oil cross. He says, I, in the name of Jesus, declare that the works of darkness and the flesh are broken off his life. He will be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And uh, sure enough, six months later, I meet a girl and um, she goes to a church. She says, if you want to date me, uh, you have to come to church. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go to church. <laughs> She's beautiful. Go to church. And uh, at this church, man, I meet Jesus. And uh, my dad, God gave my dad a promise. And the promise was this. The word of the Lord shall not depart from your mouth or your children's mouth or your children's children's mouth. And he said, I, I just declare. That. It was worse. My dad prayed, not that I would come to Jesus, but that I'd be a pastor. Not even fair. He's up there with covenants and oil. What chance do I have? <laughs> so one of the most powerful moments of my life is sitting down. I'll never forget this in my bedroom, sitting around with my dad. And he comes and he says, son, can I have a word with you? I said, yeah. And he pulls out a tear-stained journal. And it's a journal of my journey. And he says, here's all the things I believe God wanted to do in your life. And he showed me they were all ticked off. And he said, he's done it. Never forget this. Child of tears, I have been prayed into the kingdom. I, I want to share that story with you today just as a story of hope. We've got a generation of kids deconstructing their faith, walking away from the church. They hate the church because of political collusion, the hypocrisy, failure of celebrity leaders, irrelevance to cultural issues. And many of you are scanning the horizon and you've lost hope that your kids will ever appear there. And I want to tell you, if you've stopped praying, pray again. Pray again. It is not possible that a child of such tears can be lost. And you know what I've learned? Satan's great strategy for our lives is just to wear us out. The Bible says, do not become weary in doing good. Do you want to know why? Because you get weary in doing good. For at the proper time, in God's timetable, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. So if you're here today and the greatest pain in your life is a prodigal kid, lift your eyes to the horizon, lift your heart to God, let those tears flow. You never know what God will do to bring them back. God wants a church that feels what His heart feels. The reason so few do what Jesus did is because so few of us feel what Jesus felt. We feel what American culture feels. We feel what culture wars and culture crises feel. We feel what the economy feels. We feel like the highs and lows of social media. But who feels what Jesus feels? We've got to bring our hearts to Him and say, Lord, here's my heart. Here's my heart. I want to encourage you to move towards the tears. Move towards the tears. It's hard to bear a burden, but you'll meet Jesus there and that's where you'll find grace. Henry Nouwen says this, compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into the places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. 
Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us to be weak with the weak, vulnerable with the vulnerable, and powerless with the powerless. Compassion means a full immersion in the condition of being human. Now, aren't you glad that God is not stoic and distant and sent Jesus for a full immersion into the human condition? Jesus is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Here is God with tears on his cheeks, weeping for the brokenness that he encounters. And if we follow Jesus, much to our surprise, he's not going to just lead us to a life of abundance and prosperity, though we may spend a little time there. He's going to send us on a journey of tears. Albert Camus says this, live to the point of tears. I got that framed on my wall. So many of us live in the middle, busy, distracted, trivial. But there's things that make you weep and there's things that make you rejoice. And I think Camus right. We have to move towards those things that shake our hearts from the apathy of secularism. And the tears result in hope. Jürgen Moltmann says this, God weeps with us so that one day we may laugh with him. He weeps with us and enters into our sorrow to overcome it and bring us victory. Did you know there's going to be a future day, you heard about it earlier, when you're not going to be able to weep? You've got a window of weeping for your life and then it'll be gone forever. And you know what? I don't want to get to heaven with dry eyes. I want to get there with wonder and with pain, saying, thank you, Lord, that you let me into your work of redemption in the world. You're given a window of weep to weep. And you know what? Maybe today is the journey of tears. So I just, I close just by, I want to just address four groups of people. Uh, the first one is just if you got shame here, you got church hurt, you've been judged, maybe you're raised in purity culture, I don't know what it is, but you're like that woman and you feel there's no place you can go to find mercy. This can be a day of mercy for you. You imagine that counter. Jesus says to the woman caught in adultery, I do not condemn you. Jesus literally drives a wedge between the men throwing stones so an atmosphere of grace can transform her life. That can happen to you this morning. So if you need men or women, if you've got shame and you want to bring your tears of shame to Jesus, I believe this can be a day of healing. Number two, uh, if you want to, and this is a strange request, but if you want to have a burden of God to feel what he feels about this region, I'd love to be able to pray for you today. You know that the last great revival in Western culture happened here. Do you know that? On a Thursday, I was over near uh, Calvary Chapel where it happened. Can I ask you a question? Has God's heart for your region changed? The Jesus movement happened because God got a hold of a pastor's heart. And has God's heart changed? Is God like, I don't feel that way about this place anymore. <laughs> or is His heart hovering over the region just looking for someone who say, I'll feel that heart. I'll experience your divine disruption. Some of you older folks, perhaps you've got a little bit more time on your hands. Maybe God's calling you to just walk up and down these beaches and pray. Seek His heart. I'm often amazed that all it takes to remind people that they're called to prayer is a reminder to pray. So can I remind you to pray? <laughs> just like, why do we stop praying? We used to pray like 20 minutes a week for our kids. Why do we stop? Start. God loves to answer prayer. He loves to answer prayer. The fruit we need is not better sermons. We've got so much good content on the internet. It's not better worship. I'd love some worship. That's not it. You know what it is? It's Christians who feel what Jesus feels for their community. That's what we need. If we'd stop fighting with our culture and weep for our culture, we're halfway there to a move of God. When's the last time a Christian got on television and their response was to weep for the brokenness of our culture? And so it's got to start somewhere. And maybe it's going to start with you. Lastly, uh, if you've got prodigals today, I think God wants to meet your heart with hope. 
And maybe you got children of tears. Maybe your tears are dried up. Maybe you cried out. You're like, I, the glands are dry, man. The gut fauna of the vagus nerve, this thing is shut down. I mean, I've taken all I can handle. Listen, I just want to promise you, God can do what you can't do. God knows where your kids are right now. Hey, can I give you some like really encouraging news? Sin is great on the front end and awful on the back end. And uh, maybe you just need to pray, Lord, show them the consequences of their sin. Give them the aftertaste. And uh, the prodigal son's got to realize he's in a pigsty eating slot before they head for home. And uh, maybe, maybe today, that's the day where you need to pray, God, let them hit bottom before they turn around. Whatever it is, I want you to know your kids aren't forgotten. It was such a, a, a strong feeling to me. God feels every day about New York City how I felt for 45 minutes trying to find my lost kid. And I want you to know God cares. And so this may be a day where you just ask God, Lord, please give me more tears to pray them home. It's not possible that a child of such tears could be lost. So would you be willing to stand uh, as we move uh, into just a response time? Uh, in churches like this, uh, a lot of times the good stuff happens starting now. Meaning a lot of times in some churches you say amen and you go to lunch and that was that, you evaluate the talk. Uh, that's not this church, okay? Uh, we believe that God's word has been preached. It has therefore exposed our heart and God wants a response. You know, the, mo the most amazing thing, so many people go to church every week and the, the, the least likely person they think is at church is God. They expect the pastor to show up and do his job. That's what they're, they're paying the church tax for. Um, <laughs> They expect the people to sing and the kids people to do the kids thing. But so many people come to church and they only expect to encounter human traditions, not God himself. Uh, and I'm telling you uh, that God is here today and he wants to refresh your heart. He wants, to, he wants to take away your shame, give you the gift of tears, call you back to prayer, and he wants to bring your prodigals home. So let's respond, shall we? Let's respond. I'm going to turn it over to John. He's got a few other uh, particular things that he wants to share. But I want to say, when they, when they give you a chance to get prayer, get prayer. God is here and he wants to meet you this morning.